Hi, and welcome to The Curling Show, the podcast that brings you interviews with the sports top athletes and the people who shape the game. Supported by listeners who make secure donations at thecurlingshow.com. I'm Dean Gemmel, and in this edition, we talk to a skip who's been knocking on the door for a long time and finally captured a world championship this past season. The skip of the 2009 World Senior Men's Curling Champions, Eugene Ritzik, welcome to The Curling Show. Well, thank you, Dean. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. Let's start with the win in Dunedin, New Zealand. Uh, your team went through the event undefeated, but you had a close game against Andre Pauly of Switzerland in the semifinals, and the veteran Paul Pustovar's American rink certainly gave you all you could handle in the final. What's your take on the uh, quality of the field at a World Seniors? Well, it was interesting. We had a uh, fellow by the name of Bill Trishart, who I had, I, I'd heard of, but I wasn't really... Uh, aware of who he really was, and he was designated by the CCA to be our team leader to act in whatever capacity we deemed appropriate. By and large, he just made sure that uh, you know. The, uh, every, he kept you out of all, trouble, all, didn't he, Eugene? He kept you out of trouble late at night and stuff. Did. <laughs> well, uh, at our age, we don't have to worry about trouble anymore. We just, <laughs> as a matter of fact, he would phone our rooms to make sure we were awake from our naps at our <laughs> age to be ready for the senior curling. Not exactly, but. Uh, uh, he, he he had coached Paul Pustovar, and he was familiar with all of the teams. And going into the competition, he basically said, well, you'll have to watch out for Scotland and USA here. Scotland was in our group. USA was in the other group. The only time we'd have to worry about USA is if we crossed over. And, of course, uh, the Swiss team was a bit of an unknown. Other than that, Dean, uh, it, it reminded me of what the world – men's curling championships used to be like 20 years ago when I was in my competitive men's heydays. You know, you'd watch it and there would be the Scots, the Canadians, the Americans, maybe the Swedes or, or the Swiss, and then the rest of the teams were just a practice game. Right. Th- that's a lot the way the seniors was stacked up. Uh, so Was it the um, same guys, right? <laughs> uh, pretty much. You know, like you said, Postovar and I mean, the Swiss, there were several uh, curlers that had curled in world men's championships. It was interesting, although Dan Mustapick, who, who used to be from Canada, is now down there. He curled in four men's world uh, curling championships representing New Zealand and won Olympic trial and the competition, or won Olympic uh, competition. And I recall curling against him in the men's when he was living in Thunder Bay. So it, it's really interesting. It just ran into a it was like a curling reunion in certain respects. You know, you're talking about that. You, 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 this win probably still under the radar for a lot of curling fans in Canada, even around the world, because you were playing in New Zealand in early May, after all. And <laughs> while the event was on at a time when most curlers had traded their brushes for golf clubs, uh, did it feel as though you were competing in some sort of strange parallel curling universe? Well, it, this was uh, just... It, it was an endurance test competing in this world because the way it's set up in Canada, you when you win the Canadians, you represent Canada and the world the following years. Following years, so we basically were preparing for this thing for a year, and then you're right when everybody's interest in, in to a certain extent our interest. There was no ice left here in, in Saskatoon. Our interests had gone to turn to golf. Uh, we had to get fired up again and start curting. It was tough. Uh, we we intentionally scheduled to come into New Zealand a week curdy to get back on track, and uh, we ended up going to Naseby. The, uh, at that time, uh, or I th- up until about a year ago, it was the only uh, dedicated curting club in the Pacific Rim, and it is still the only dedicated curting club in the Southern Hemisphere. So the only way we could get re- refocused and geared up again was to go and curl on that ice before the event. So, so when you headed over there, when was the last time you'd thrown rock? Was it like a probably at least a two-week gap yeah. between throwing rocks in Saskatchewan? It right? was pre- pretty, mu- pretty much the first week in April is when all the rings right. shut down here. And we didn't, uh, the, the competition didn't start till the 26th, the 27th of April. I forget exactly what day. I, actually, practice was on the 26th. So, yeah, there was a two- to three-week lull there. And it, uh, but, you know, on the other hand, we weren't as bad off as some of the teams, especially the Southern Hemisphere teams like Australia and New Zealand. They, had been, they hadn't thrown a rock for, like, eight months, and it was just the start of the curling season. Opening spiel of the year is the World Seniors. Yeah. That's, that's sort of interesting. So it was, it was different. It was just a, 
a real uh, prolonged uh, event for us to to go and represent Canada and the world. Turns into just about a three week odyssey, I guess, doesn't it? All told. But, yeah, it yeah. Uh, it was quite a journey, you know, and it, it, it's hard to acclimatize because you're six hours out when you get there, and uh, you know you're you, you should be uh, uh, you, you should be wide awake and you're sleepy at supper time. You know, it, it was weird. It took us three days to to acclimatize, and that was part of the challenge of going and curling uh, in, in New Zealand, and then you know to get back on track and. Get uh, get your rhythm, your timing back. So it it, it was a bit of a challenge. Hey, you spent a lot of times uh, chasing dreams on ice. Uh, you yeah. played in two briars out of Saskatchewan, uh, losing in the semifinals in '85 and in the finals in '88. Uh, you've been in five Canadian seniors, I guess. Uh, right. yeah, a lot of wax at it, winning in 2008. Uh, does winning a world championship does it validate all that investment in, in the game, or is the game itself a, a big enough reward? Well. I, I enjoy the people, I enjoy the sport, I enjoy the challenge, but a couple of things really hit home after dedicating most of my life to curling. I started curling when I was 10 years old. I'm 59 now, so it was just about 40 years of curling. I'm glad you're getting the hang of it, Eugene. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 it was uh, really something when you put the maple leaf on your back, first of all. That was... Uh, I, I think like a dream come true, and then uh, winning it all was surreal. It just it never really hit home until you came back here, and with all the emails and all of the you know, congratulatory letters and phone calls and whatnot else, it just really started to sink in that boy, this was something. But uh, it was really tough getting there, and it, it somehow it was it it just was so much hard work to get there and and be there that. Uh, I almost felt when it was all over that God, I must have deserved this. You know, it was only a just reward for the years I spent in curling rings. I'm going to say I think you were due, Eugene. I'm going to, I'm going to chime in and say you were you were, you were due. But you know, you haven't been just uh, whiling away your time in the senior circuit. Uh, you guys, uh, with your prior seniors rink, I guess, uh, lost to Pat Simmons in the finals of the 2007 Saskatchewan Men's Championship, the yeah. Saskatchewan Tankard. Uh, how do you account for this, some of the success you've had in men's? Uh, I don't know how to say this politely, Eugene, but in your advancing years. <laughs> you know what I'd say? I'd say it's the free guard zone rule. Curling's turned to be way more cerebral than it used to be, especially for us double jumpers out here in Saskatchewan. We are notorious for playing and throwing what we thought were the high hard ones back then, but uh, we noticed that the likes of Martin and Simmons throw that, that weight and more. And uh, to be able to though, mix up the type of shots that you play, I think... Uh, allows us to be competitive, first of all, and secondly, experience. I mean, it's it's a uh, ice chest out there. It's a mind game out there, and we find that we've seen enough situations. We just know, you know, how to deal with them with our with our own potential and uh, make the best of it. And uh, yeah, we that, and then uh, this year we won a World Curling Tour event here in Saskatoon. We just entered right. it for fun and. Uh, yeah, well, I thought it was for fun. The guys wanted to enter it. We've had some pretty good sponsorships, so uh, we thought, why not give them the exposure? It was a triple knockout, and I said to the guys, well, we'll get three games. It's going to cost us $400 a game because it was a $1,200 entry fee. Well, we come off the ice after the first game, and I said, guys, we're down to $300 a game now. We never lost a game after our first game. We went through the A qualified through the A, beat uh, Randy Furby in the semifinals and beat Joel Jordison in the finals. So I don't know. I think it's a little bit of, of goofy luck and uh, a little bit of good management and hard work too, though. Yeah, that, that field was, uh, wasn't, like you said, you just mentioned two names right there. It wasn't a pushover field that you won. And do you ever wish you had your senior's brains back when you had your 30-something body? Well, <laughs> that and, and the team I've got now. You know, these guys uh, at, at times have to carry me. I'll have to admit that. And I've got three great Curtis with me and I'm Going wow, they make my shots pretty easy. I I get to throw a lot of guards guards, and that's a sign of a heck of a good curling team in front of a skip when the skip comes down to the hack and merely's putting pants on on shots. So uh, I just got a great bunch of guys to curl with. That's part of it. I'm really comfortable curling with the guys I have. This is a, a bit of a new team, right? Two new players uh, in this team from yeah, your previous it, Canadian seniors teams. It it, it was uh, you know. 
You know what? I should say who they are, too. We're talking to you. Kevin Kaltoff, Vern, Vern, Kevin Kaltoff, Vern Anderson, and Dave Folk. Yes, and uh, it was a bit of a fluke. Uh, my regular third from previous, well, previous to this team, um, had knee surgery and uh, couldn't curl. So I get on the phone and start phoning around, and next thing I know, I've got Kevin Kaltoff, although we had sort of talked about curling, or Kevin and I talked about curling together anyway, and then Vern Anderson, who was a senior skip and represented Saskatchewan at one of the national competitions, I forget what year, I think it might have been about 203 or 204, 2004. Anyway, uh, we just came together, and Dave Folk, our, my regular lead for, uh, for five years here out of the eight, six years out of the eight, and it just gelled. Yeah, it was, it was a, a bit of a fluke there to get that team lined up. It was kind of a, an emergency or a desperate uh, situation when I'm phoning in September to try to get a team together a couple years ago. Funny how sometimes those teams do come together that way. You're right. It? You know what, often I found that it's fresh, you're a little bit on edge, you're not sure you're, what, what you're going to get out of each other, and you're maybe you're just a little keener to make sure you don't let the, the, the people down you. You don't know how, you don't know how everybody's going to react. So uh, I think sometimes you just are a little more focused when you come out and curl with a new group of curlers. Hey, Pat Sanders from Canada won the women's side of the World Seniors, also going through undefeated. Uh, but in a curlingzone.com forum, she wrote, and I'm pulling it up here, she, I think it was her, unless uh, somebody else was masquerading as Pat Sanders, which I don't, I don't think would have happened. But anyway, she said, I have heard from other countries that Canada is no longer the center of curling, but they just don't realize it. The world is leaving us behind, and given the different styles and selection criteria used by other countries, Perhaps this is a wake-up call. I really do believe that we need to declare our teams earlier, provide funding, and send them on tour to play in Europe and Asia so that they become familiar with other teams' style and play. Do you agree with Pat, or do you think her judgment was a bit clouded by all that good New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc? <laughs> That's an interesting observation. Uh, I, I don't know that we would learn so much by going over there and curting. I think that they've learned uh, <laughs> their... They're curting the strategy from us. If if we want to create an advantage, let's bar them from coming and and curting in our events and taking our coaches and uh, top level uh, technical people and uh, using them to their advantage. So, um, no, I I I think that uh, curling has been uh, more of a recreational game in Canada than a competitive game. You take a look at the makeup of most curling clubs. It's uh, the, the, the elite curlers in every curling club will represent maybe whatever five percent of the curlers, ninety-five percent of the curlers, yeah, at uh, the best, recreational I mean. curlers, and and that's what we need for the sport. And I think that dimension of the sport is really important uh, for clubs to sustain themselves. And I'd say the way we're doing it is just fine in Canada. And uh, those curlers that want to commit and play at that elite level, they do have opportunities here. There is some funding, there's some good sponsorships. We have great money offered at bond spiels, and that's why the likes of, uh, you know, Martin or Howard or uh, like Glenn Howard or, or Furby, those guys are in the hundreds of thousands. So uh, I, I think it's just fine the way it is. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be, I grew up in Canada. I live in the United States now. I'm an, actually an American citizen too, but uh, I think Pat's way off there. Uh, I, I actually asked, I sent her a private message on Curling Zone to see if she'd come on the show, but I haven't heard from her. I'll have to reach out to her. Uh, <laughs> I, I think... I think the game is strong, Canada. I think if anything, you know, it's worrying about uh, keeping clubs strong. You know, I think the, the competitive game is deep and strong. I mean, you can talk about, you know, teams in Asia and Europe, but they have one or two good teams. Exactly. And, I mean, if that's, they want to, if that's the way they want to approach the sport, I guess that's their business. But uh, I, I just think that uh, you're right that we have to try to promote the grassroots level of curling try to get uh, kids uh, involved in the sport. You know, curling has got an inherent problem with it, and I've always said this. I've, I've done the banquet circuit and sportsman's dinners, and, and this is my take on it. You, you take uh, basketball, they'll throw up a hoop and on, the, on, your, on the front of your garage, and you can pretend you're, you know, the uh, Kobe or the, uh, some all-star dream of yours, and then... Baseball, the same thing. You grab a bat and a ball goes into uh, open playground and you bat it around. Football, the same thing. But curling, it's got a very, uh, very specific equipment and very specific playing field or surface to play on. 
And I, I think that that's why we maybe can't get the kids as involved as we do in some of the other sports because they can't emulate their heroes, uh, you know, in the backyards or down the street. And that's the problem we have with curling. So I don't know how to over- overcome that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that's and that's a tough nut to crack. But uh, you know, I think you also make a point out that you know, kids growing up want to emulate uh, professional athletes. So growing the elite level of the game isn't a bad thing either. So. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, you're right. It's a tough nut. You know, I, I don't know how we get more curling clubs built and make it a little more accessible. But, uh, uh, you know, I think people are trying anyways. But they it's are, tough. and, and uh, there has to be a concerted effort by the associations. And I know the Canadian Curling Association is doing that, and I know our Saskatchewan Curling Association is doing that to promote and encourage, whether it be the Junior Rocks or the different programs that they've got for Junior Curtis and and it seems like, especially here in Saskatchewan, if there are a few individuals in the community that are really keen on working with the kids, there's been some tremendous growth at the junior level, kids level, the 10 year old and up in Saskatoon. They've got several super leagues that are at various age groups and they're packed. They're, they're waiting lists for kids to get into them. So, uh, it, it, it's a lot on, uh, the effort that one puts into promoting it. Well, that's some good news out of Saskatchewan because we've had a lot of uh, less than great news out of your province when it comes to curling. And well, and when yeah, I've been in Saskatoon in January, I wonder what people do if they don't curl. <laughs> Not much. Uh, try to start their cars when it's 40 below. It doesn't happen all the time. So you stay at home, basically. But where, where it is hurting in, in Saskatchewan is in the small rural areas that are being depopulated. And uh, you can't... Uh, sustain a curling club it's just getting too expensive to keep an artificial ice plant going and uh, to keep a rink open so that's where we're losing a lot of the curlers but yeah and that's they, a that's a curling population and that's a, just a population problem really well it is more than anything that's unfortunately the way i, I guess urbanization has taken us and progress so people are all uh, focusing or glomming into larger urban centers in the smaller towns they're just dying off. They're becoming ghost towns. Hey, Eugene, for a lot of casual curling fans, uh, their last mem- memory of you uh, might have been the 1988 Briar final in Chicoutimi against Pat Ryan. Yes. Uh, that was actually the Briar that I sullied with my own appearance, so I was in the stands watching as your last draw, draw came up, i got to say, about a hectare short. Uh, <laughs> I've never really, I never talked to you about it that, that evening, probably because uh, I don't know why, but I didn't. Um, what really happened on that shot? Well, you know, it's interesting. Before the game started, Don Lewis came up to me and he said, uh, guys, uh, he came up to me personally, he says, guys, he says, don't dawdle. He said, curl as fast as you can. And I looked at him and I said, why? He <laughs> this said, is the ice uh, maker, Don Lewis. Yeah, yeah. He said, curl as uh, fast as you can. And I said, why? He said, because the committee made me cover up all the sheets with carpet. That's my said, that's my next note here. I, go on, tell it. This is a great yeah, story. Yeah, he says the. I didn't want to do it, but the committee said that I had to cover all the sheets with carpet. There's sensors in those ice. They're not going to get a true reading on the surface temperature. And he says, I don't know if I can keep the, the ice in your sheet. It was interesting. Already on the eighth end, I recalled it was because that was one of the few times, the only time that the Chikudumi had a, a large crowd. I don't think it was a sellout, but they had a large crowd there from the few hundreds that they had right. often during the week. And I'll never forget, it was just kind of the air was very damp and clammy. My right hand was sweaty. So typically what I'll do is I'll take and put my right hand down on the ice just to cool it off and wipe it off on my pants. Right. I still recall doing this, putting my hand on the ice, getting it cooled off and wiping my pants and uh, getting ready to throw my, hot hat, my rock, looking down, and my handprint is still wet in the ice. <laughs> oh, really? And uh, we started getting some real wacky times on draws on the ninth and the 10th end. And uh, it was interesting. Pat uh, had thrown a, a draw because the, the times are really coming down on the 10th end. Pat had thrown a draw, or was it the 9th end? I'd, I'd have to watch the film again. It was either the 9th or 10th end because we were getting some slow times. And I remember Walchuk, Don Walchuk talking to Pat Ryan about the fact that this ice is really slowing down, and Pat threw a draw that didn't happen to get into any of the sludge or the fudge, and it went sailing through. 
And it was just one of those things. It was, uh, I, I don't know if people remember, I think it was the 72-73 world with Harvey Mazinki and, and Shal Oskarius in Sweden. It was in Regina. I watched it. Same thing, although that was more drastic, where if rocks got into soft spots, they'd slow down, or maybe it had to do with rotations. I'm not sure. The bottom line is, I threw what I thought was going to be in a in a good spot, and I let go of the rock with the same speed that I that I normally would have, throwing where I was throwing, and it just went it just dead. died. It just died. It it it's like it went through over some sandpaper through salt. So. And you know what? I don't think I was there, and I remember when they covered it. That was when they had five sheets of the briar too. They covered yeah. all the other sheets, and I remember sitting in the stands where else I think that's not a good idea. And nobody yeah. on television, I don't think, saw that, really. Uh, I guess they, they, they got them ready for a song and dance number during the closing ceremonies, which I'm sure yeah. you loved. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't come there for the song and dance. But <laughs> <laughs> that is what happened, though. I, do, you know, I don't think most people realize that they, nope. all, this you know, all this carpet went out. All this carpet. And few people uh, uh, have asked me, and you're one of the few people that really asked me, well, what happened? And, uh, you know, usually people have, Jokes, you know, they'll come up to me. Oh, Ritz, I can they'll put their hands around their throat. Yeah, you know, from the '88 bar and stuff like that. Just joking, but nobody's really stopped, or very few people have stopped to ask me. And uh, that's what did happen there. It was uh, wonky ice, and I just happened to throw that last draw in a spot. And some people have referred to it as the last uh, rock of the game, but it wasn't. Pat Ryan still had a last shot, another rock. He did. Yeah. What I would have done. And as it turned out, of course, he didn't have to throw it. So yeah, you know, I, it's uh, it's. In, I, I figured that was what was the case, but I've never actually heard you explain it. So I'm, I'm glad I asked you about it because I I thought for sure that must have been what happened. Yeah, but, well, uh, I think this was the first time I really explained it publicly. But I've look at that! I'm breaking news here on the curling that. show, Eugene. <laughs> well, uh, I'd have to say it is <laughs> twenty some odd years late, but what the heck? Oh uh, yeah, it was. I mean, it, we were quite a Cinderella story then again. You were. Um, we were, uh, uh, my front end, I just had picked up. Dal Shaughnessy played third for me. He played third for me uh, uh, for about three years. And, I mean, it was a team that just came together and things happened. We gelled, as you said. Sometimes uh, that happens when you get together as a as a new group like that. Yeah, I, keep ta- I hate to keep talking about bad luck with you, Eugene, but you also had your cars or your shoes stolen out of your car last year. Oh, that was... I can't open really notice. Perfect. I can't open notice though that you did fairly well after you got some new ones. Are it you wondering that what, what might have happened if you'd invested in some new shoes over the last twenty years? <laughs> it wasn't easy adjusting to those new shoes. Yeah, it's sitting in uh, the driveway. My vehicle was sitting in the driveway, and somebody uh, smashed the driver's window, cleaned off the dash, my visor, my my parking meter change, and. Uh, grabbed the curtain bag off the back seat because uh, there was enough room, as the police said, enough room to throw in all the trinkets that they've grabbed off the off the dash or off the front of the vehicle, and they took off with it. And that was just before going to, uh, well, it's the northerns here. It's the last level before provincial playdowns for right. seniors. And uh, we had to phone uh, uh, Asham Curtain Supplies and get a, another pair of shoes flown out. And I picked them up at the airport just on my way out of town to compete in the Northern Senior Competition. And uh, the reason I had to go there is because I'm I'm really partial to stainless steel sliders in a certain type of shoe, and there was none available. And luckily, it uh, it worked out. But it did take some getting used to all that. I mean, you did get, you got what, stainless discs from Asham on a... On a uh... Well, I can't do discs. That's the problem. I've tried to stainless steel discs. They just don't work right for me. I have to get uh, a regular, what would be the shape of a Teflon slider but in stainless steel so it's kind of a custom-made slider is what it is okay and, uh, yeah they they and not only that uh, this happened just before going to the northerns all my curtain gear i had certain knee, knee tensors and my gloves are my team jacket i had a couple pairs of curtain pants uh, my favorite curtain mitts that were worn out in the ends and my sure. thumbs and all of that like it, I, I was just totally out of my comfort zone i had none of my my <laughs> my security blankets with me. I'm walking on the ice with all new attire and new shoes that feel totally different. And some people maybe uh, don't think that uh, they, they maybe thought that uh, I was overreacting to it. But I still 
say if you take a like a professional golfer, Tiger Woods, and, yeah. and just before he started out uh, on a PGA event, you walk up to him and say, "Oh, by the way, you're going to play with these clubs, and these are Callaways or whatever, which he never ever plays with." Well, you know, how would he uh, handle that? Or you take a figure skater that's been practicing in the skates, and just before a competition. You take them away and give them a brand new pair that aren't broken in yet. Yeah, no, I I think it's it's like a nightmare. You know, you wake it it's was. a it's a nightmare the night before an event. You wake up and think you forgot your curling bag. That's basically <laughs> what happened to you. Well, that's pretty much what happened, and uh, it was never like, recovered though, right? What's this? Never, never been no, recovered, never right? Uh, I had a we had a team checkbook in the curling bag because we had a team curling account. And I did find that checkbook, uh, well, it was found in Saskatoon in a certain sector of the city. And uh, that's as much as I found from it. The police indicated that probably to avoid being identified if they ever got stopped uh, with a checkbook in that bag, they just tossed it out of the window because that was the only identification in that bag. But uh, it it was obviously somebody here in the city that... uh, decided that uh, they wanted a pair of stainless steel curtain shoes. I guess. So there's a hardened criminal somewhere in Saskatoon wandering around in your curling pants and your curling shoes. <laughs> well, the suggestion was it might have been a sore loser that we eliminated going to the north. <laughs> yeah, you might, you might tend to think that way. <laughs> but uh, no, it wasn't that. All right, Eugene, we finished with the run back. I give you a topic and you give me your thoughts in one to three words. You ready? Sure. The extra width of the international sheet. Great. You did like it. I did like it, yes. Team Pat Simmons, miserable 2008-2009 season. they got to shake up that lineup. Oh, yeah? You're, you're, yeah. About, you're going for a shake-up to the line. I think, yep. they, I think they actually did shake it up a little bit. Well, they the, did, and uh, you know what, I still don't know if they've got the right combination there, but uh, they, they've just got to move things around there, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm a good bunch of guys, I, like I always good say when I talk guys. about They're them. They're really great. You know, and and I, I don't think it's because of anybody specifically, it's just that Sometimes you need a combination that works right, and you've got to rotate personnel sometimes. Uh, the long stretch without a Briar win by a Saskatchewan team. Boy, um, I, I say just bad luck. <laughs> Maybe. Bit of bad luck. You were bad luck in 88 there. You yes. Doomed I, by I, the carpeting. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I, I think uh, we've got uh, some great curlers in our province, but I just think that they're unlucky. The tenth end of this year's men's world curling final. Hey, if I was uh, uh, Kevin Martin, I, I I would probably have done the same thing. Kevin knows what he can and can't do. Uh, I, I every skip calls their own game the way they want to. Interesting point. Uh, the influence of the Olympics on curling. Phenomenal, just phenomenal. There's nothing better that's happened to curling than. The Olympics. It was interesting when I was in New Zealand, as an aside, I found out just because curling is in the Olympics, just because right. the, World Cur- uh, the World Curling Federation is going to receive $14.2 million from the Olympic Committee. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it certainly is. It, you know, there's, there's some things that I think the game has lost, but uh, I would say on balance, it's certainly a big positive. Um, the commercial real estate market in Saskatoon. It's been recession proof. Really? Oh, crazy here. Good for you. Yes. Uh, Del Shaughnessy. <laughs> Great friend. We still keep in touch, and uh, he's still talking about moving back to Saskatoon and challenging me at a senior level. He plays for Kurt Balderson these days, Yes, he does. Yeah. Out of Grand Prairie. Yep. The uh, starring role of curling on tonight's episode of The Bachelorette. <laughs> well, I got a sneak preview of that one. I don't think you call that curling. <laughs> no. I was at, you know... It would, they were, I, well, you figured they'd be horrible. I, I wish they spent more time talking about how hard it was, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't catch the whole thing yet, but uh, mainly because I can't stomach a whole episode of The Bachelor. Yeah, I, I don't ever watch it. I mean, I, even if I've got nothing to watch, I don't watch it. So, uh, but I did uh, sneak a, a peek of the uh, clips on, uh, on the Internet today, or on the uh, website today. Right. And finally, the Saskatchewan Provincial Men's Playdown format. Uh, it's... It's finally right. We, we, we've got the, the right formula there. We just got to get a team that's going to be lucky enough to break through after they get out of Saskatchewan. Yeah, you guys have a great format, though. I've never heard. I think everybody thinks it's, it's fair it, and, and smart. It is. And... I mean, we do get the best teams. Years ago, when they only took the top eight teams and, and the way they had an elimination process, we didn't always get the eight best teams to the provincials. 
now when you there's spots from the World Curling Tour, the spots from the Saskatchewan Curling Tour, which promotes competitive competitive curling within our, our province, and then the uh, the traditional elimination rounds. We've got the best combination of what what you can get to ensure we get the best 16 curlers to the province, and uh, that's what I like about it. That's the best balance. You have to have some pre-qualifying, and then you have yes. to have traditional routes too, I think. But Oh, uh, yeah. It, it, it does really well here. We get great crowds, great attendance for our provincials. They're held in arenas all the time now just to accommodate the crowds. I think part of it is because we're bringing 16 teams and you get representation from all around the province. And as you've indicated, some teams pre-qualify. So already there's, there's uh, pre-event hype uh, that the media can, can promote and the host committee can promote that you know, certain key teams are going to be there. And it's just great for the game here. Hey, Eugene, I'm still laughing and thinking about Don Lewis telling you to curl fast. Has anybody since then asked you to curl fast? <laughs> no, I curl quick as it is. I get frustrated when teams curl slow. Right. All right, hey, I give everybody on this show a chance to, to uh, mention their sponsors. Does your team have some? Yes. Uh, well, our, our biggest sponsor is Seedmaster. Uh, they, they're a world-renowned air seed manufacturer. And if you're not into agriculture, that doesn't mean anything. But anybody, Here in New Jersey, very, Eugene, I'm going to get myself some air seed stuff. <laughs> Seedmaster's. And uh, TRX RV is uh, another great uh, sponsor of ours, and uh, Boss Lubricants is a sponsor of ours, and Exclusive Auto and Marine up in Prince Albert uh, is another sponsor. We really appreciate their support. Well, good for all those companies uh, for supporting you guys, and congratulations again. Pleasure to talk to you, Eugene. Good luck next season. Thank you, Dean, for calling. I enjoyed this. That's Eugene Ritzik on The Curling Show. A quick thanks to anyone who has joined The Curling Show group on Facebook and to the generous people who have made a donation to this podcast at thecurlingshow.com. Thanks for listening. Enjoy some pudding. <laughs>